So here we see lectures here about prime numbers. More specifically, uh, we will define prime numbers first, then we will talk about a very simple theorem called the prime factorization theorem, and another theorem about the existence of infinitely many prime numbers, just to get a feel. These are, they are not technical, they are very, very intuitive. And so I don't think that there will be any difficulty in understanding them. And then I will to ask a question and we'll take a break. And after the break, we'll have to get back into a little bit of calculus. We'll talk about the logarithm functions. We'll talk about a great theorem, the prime number theorem about the distribution of prime. This is the point of today's lecture, this prime number theorem. And then we'll wrap up with a discussion about open questions relating to prime numbers. And as usual, we'll have uh, in between sometimes my own comments or thoughts or musings and a little bit of history. And the lecture will seem a little bit more theoretical because of the logarithm functions and because of the statement of the prime number theorem. But I think it's worth making the effort. And uh, what, my, what I want to convey is the beauty of this theorem even if we don't understand what it says in detail. So let me get started. I start with a little story which uh, came to mind as I was preparing this lecture. So my son had a friend who travels to Egypt on some scholarship after college. There he befriended some young people. One evening they were talking and you know, friendly young people, they can be not very religiously eager. They were open-minded. So they were talking about religion and God. My son's friend who is a non-religious Jew argued that God does not exist. But his Muslim friends, the Egyptian, his Egyptian friend, then just pointed at the moon and asked, isn't it beautiful? My friend said, yes. And so the Muslim people said, so, as if that was a proof for existence of God. So that's a nice story of how they view something extremely beautiful, uh, miraculously beautiful as proof that God exists. Now, if I believe that God existed, I would say that God gave us not only the miracle of the moon and the stars, but also they gave us the prime num the numbers and prime numbers among them. The prime numbers are such a miracle that uh, it almost gives you a religious feeling of it, of the beauty. So let's just get a little bit into the mathematical mood by talking about numbers. So we know how to count, right? One, two, three, four, and so on. And these are called the natural numbers. These little babies are learning how to count and they are understanding. My little grandson knows how to count till 11 by now. And <clears throat> so he understands numbers. These are the natural numbers. Now, historically, mathematicians thought of numbers and they next they thought about fractions, ratios. Mathematically, it's more like nowadays with our understanding today, it's more natural to talk about negative numbers first. So uh, we'll introduce the negative integers, minus one, minus three, minus 200 and so on. And this is quite a leap. Mathematicians in the 17th century were still struggling to make sense of what these negative numbers really mean. They were writing books, trying to explain why these numbers really make sense. So these negative numbers together, negative integers, together with the natural numbers, they together form and with zero form what we call integers, integer numbers. Now it's logical to introduce fractions. A fraction is something of this sort, m over n. We also read it as m divided by n. 
and this makes sense anytime n is not zero. So we are talking of fractions. And so these, we also call them ratios. The ratios were very well understood in antiquity, but interestingly, mathematicians, philosophers in those <coughs> times, didn't think of them as, as numbers. They were thinking them of a different entity. They were ratios of numbers, not as legitimate numbers. Today, we don't make such a, actually, it's a little hard to make such a distinction. Of course, it's a number, any fraction, any ratio is a number. Going hey, Peter, on, yes. I have a question. Go back to the previous slide. Um, I was trying to, you know, I've used negative numbers for, <laughs> since high school, but what is the reason behind the creation of negative numbers? Is it just, is it just to say, there are less things it is than that, or is it just reference to a zero? What is the meaning behind negative numbers? It might be, the, a, silly the, might be a silly question, but I was no, just wondering it's not about a silly it. question. The, the main reason is because if you just think of numbers and you think you can do addition, then of course you can do the opposite operation, which is subtraction. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can subtract, say, four minus two, and it's perfectly meaningful, mm -hmm. the result is two. But by the same token, you would want to say two minus four. And what's that? Minus you two. Would like, you would like that to have a result. Uh -huh. Also, when you solve equations, you solve an equation and you get the solution of the equation, say x equals five. But just make one change of sign, you get a different equation, and the solution would be something like, not five, but what we, of course, now we just say negative five, minus five. But how come one equation has a solution, the other doesn't? So mm -hmm. to make sense of, to, to just make order, to have everything yeah. consistent, also practically today in accounting, of course, we have debt, which is a negative number. We have mm -hmm. assets expressed in positive numbers and we have debts expressed in negative numbers. And yeah. when you do accounting, it, it, it perfectly makes sense and it's good reason to have negative numbers, mm -hmm. so. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering, you know, I, I don't yeah. see negative, I, I don't see negative things in my life. All I see Actually, is accumulation. <laughs> you, you do, sometimes you go, sometimes you go to a parking garage, which has floors for parking underground, and they have minus one, minus two, minus three for the floors underground. Mm -hmm. So, it's, so, so, even, so it's, reference, it's referencing a zero, right? Z zero is the, the ground level. Yeah. And so then first floor, second floor, third floor going up. Yeah. And negative one, negative two, second, negative third yeah. floor going down. So, so once you define, yeah, once you define the reference zero, then above or below is positive or negative. Exactly. Yeah, so if you it. put these on a line, I don't, didn't draw a line. I had in another lecture a line, uh, uh, which is the line, the number line. You have sure. zero somewhere on that. To the right, you have positive numbers. Sure. To the left, yeah. you have negative numbers. Yeah. So now going on. <clears throat> Thank you. I want to make this observation that these natural numbers, the set of natural numbers, the set of natural number numbers, uh -huh, here I have a typo, I have to correct that. And the set of integer numbers, they are in some sense discrete. What I mean intuitively is that you take any two numbers, say two and three, there is nothing in between them. Integers just come one, after the other in a sequence. It's a discrete set. By contrast, the set of rational numbers is dense. And what I mean by dense is this. Uh, you can find as close as you want, you can find two fractions close to each other. Or if, in, to put it in another way, you take any two fractions in between, you can find another fraction. So for instance, if I take one third and one fourth, we can find the fraction that's in between them. 
And what is that? One over three is the same as eight over 24. One over four is the same as six over 24, but then seven over 24 is in between them. So one over three is bigger than seven over 24, which is bigger than one four. And I take two other numbers even closer to each other, like one over 100 and one over 101. And I do a similar calculation and I find a number in between. And so no matter what two numbers you take, there is always something in between. This is, makes the fractions as a set look very different from integers. And going on, looking at the fractions, we realize this set is dense, but it's not complete. And what I mean is that there are items which are not part of this set, and yet we can find fractions as close as we want to them. And I'll give, I give an example. I had this in a lab, another lecture. I won't prove anything. I'm just saying square root of two is not a fraction. It's not too difficult to show that, but we won't bother it now. Just believe me that it's not a fraction. And yet I can find fractions as close to it as I want. So in that sense, the set of fractions is dense, but not complete. Now, if I do some operation to complete the set of fractions, then we get what we call the real numbers. And this is a complete set. And this is what we represent as usually as a number line. Any real number is a point on the li line and every point on the line on the line corresponds to a number. And now if we were to do mathematics, we would get into a little algebra and we would realize that something is missing. So for instance, this equation x squared minus one equals zero has solutions, two solutions, x equals one and x equals minus one are both solutions of this. I just change one little sign. I take x squared plus one equals zero. And it seems to have no solutions. And this is not nice. It's, it's something is wrong here. Something is unbalanced. And to fix this, to balance this situation, we introduce a symbol called i. We think of it as square root of minus one, but it's just a symbol. And its defining property is that i squared is minus one. And now we consider all the expressions of this type x plus y i. And these are what we call the complex numbers. And they, instead of a number line, we have now a plane, a complex plane. Every complex number corresponds to a point in the plane. And every point in the plane corresponds to a complex number. And with these complex numbers, we just do the usual arithmetic addition, we do calculus, everything that we do with real numbers, we can do with complex numbers. But I digressed. I didn't want to get into complex numbers, not even real numbers, not even fractions maybe. Let's get back to our good old natural numbers. So never mind if you got a little confused by this uh, num review of numbers, just ignore that. We are getting back to basics. So <clears throat> I'm just saying that we'll, uh, in the complex of, in the realm of real numbers, we did calculus. In the realm of complex numbers, we do something similar that's called complex analysis. And that's a field in itself. But back to the natural numbers. What can we do with natural numbers? Well, we can do addition, right? We can always add two numbers and get another number. But once we do addition, we can also do subtraction, which is just the opposite operation to addition. And once we do addition, we can do repeated addition, which is just multiplication. For instance, three times five is really five plus five plus five. It's just a repeated addition, three times five. 
And so we can do multiplication. And once we do multiplication, we can do the opposite operation, which is division. And so this is where I wanted to get to division of numbers. And nowadays, you say division, even a, a, a middle school child would say, what do you mean division with remainder or the division with a decimal point? And so we have to make clear whether, so for instance, seven divided by two, you can say it's three with remainder what? That's what we call integer division. Or seven divided by two is 3.5. And that's what we call decimal division or floating point division. So we need to make a distinction between the two. We are interested in this integer division, that's the simpler one. <clears throat> The, this distinction between the two divisions does have very important practical applications. So for instance, if you have a chocolate bar which eight, with eight rows of five squares, so that's 40 little squares of ch chocolate, and you have to divide it to six children. And how do you do that? If you want to give squares, well, you give to each child uh, six squares, did I do this right? Eight times five, yes, that's 40. So six children, six squares, that's 36. And there are four left. And those four, it's easiest if you eat them, don't, give, don't try to divide the four squares to six children. So often, even in practice, when we have to divide something, then we have a remainder and we have to decide how to deal with the remainder. But it's, this also has important applications in computer science. In the computer chips of our computers, uh, we have a completely different way of doing the integer division and the decimal division. The integer division is much, much simpler and faster. And the decimal division is more resource consuming for the computer. So anytime we can, we try to do, to do integer division rather than decimal division. So if you know a little bit about computers, then this should make sense. Otherwise, never mind. So now we started with natural numbers. We realized we can do division and we realized we can do division with remainder. And then we notice a curious thing. Sometimes we do have a remainder. So for instance, 16 divided by three is five with remainder one. But if we take 15 divided by three, that's just five and there is no remainder. So that's a curious thing. When do we have a remainder and when we don't have a remainder? So when can do integer division without a remainder? That's so nice, so clean. And this, takes us to our first definition. We say that the number A is divisible by the number B if there is no remainder when we do the integer division A divided by B. We also say that B divides A or that B is a factor of A. So just to give some examples, six is divisible by two because six divided by two equals three with no remainder. But seven is not divisible by two, because if I try to divide seven by two, I get three with remainder one. So we already have some fun because we can talk about divisibility. And then a question arises, how do we check whether a number A is divisible by B? Sometimes you can think of a big number, something in the millions, and another number, something in the thousands, and you wonder, can, can, is the big number divisible by the small one? Can I do the division without a remainder? And one answer is, yeah, just try to do the division and see if there is a remainder. Nowadays we have computers, so we can do the division on our calculators and we can do the division easier before we had to do the division on paper. <clears throat> So this 
leads to a few fundamental questions. We talked about division, but can I always do the division or sometimes I can and sometimes I can't. And if I do the division, do I, no matter how I try to do it, do I always get the same result or the result would depend on how I do the division. And so first of all, we have this theorem, which is extremely intuitive and easy to comprehend, but uh, it's still a theorem. We would need to prove it. Euclid, it's called Euclidean division. And it says given two integers, n and d, there are two integers q and r such that n equals d times q plus r. But this says that if I try to divide n by d, I get the quotient, the result r q and the remainder r. And the numbers q and r are unique with these properties. So this theorem, which comes from Euclid, just tells us that yes, we can always do division and the result is unique. We can always, we will always get the same result. Sounds obvious, but if you try to prove it, it's not an axiom, so you need to prove it. And if you try to prove it, then it's not so very obvious how it's so easy to prove it. So we won't bother about proving it. I just wanted to mention it. When we write this, n is called the numerator, d is called the denominator, q is called the quotient, quotient and R is called the remainder. And now, <clears throat> my comment about division and divisibility is that uh, children in school are taught to do division and it's so boring. They are given numbers after numbers after numbers to just do it and they get bored. And that's what I think the first time they start disliking mathematics, I think it, there are ways of making that fun and children don't have to do a hundred divisions to understand the concept. Children will learn it anyway, do a few and then go on. So now how do we do integer division? And there are several algorithms, several methods. We won't go through them, but it's important because in computer science and engineering, we may decide to use one method or another depending on the context. And there are a few cute little statements about divisibility. So for instance, a number n is divisib divisible by 10 when the last digit is zero. So you don't even have to try to do the division. You look at the number, you say, uh-huh, this 30 is divisible by 10 because it ends in zero, but 49 is not. A number is divisible by five if the last digit is zero or five. A number is divisible by two if the last digit is even. And a cute one, a number n is divisible by three if the digits of the number add up to a number divisible by three. So for instance, 39, you add three plus nine, that's 12. 12 is clearly divisible by three. So 39 is divisible by three. So these tricks, these little cute tricks for divisibility are true when we write the numbers in the usual way, in this Hindu Arabic way in base 10. <clears throat> so now a, few, a little history. This is called Euclidean division. Euclid never stated it explicitly in his treatise element. However, we were, he was doing what is essentially division. He was doing repeated subtraction and then getting a remainder. For him, all these the numbers were not really numbers, were uh, what he called lines, segments of line. And he was just cutting off pieces from one segment, he, he expressed, expressed everything in geometric terms, but he, this is what he was doing in reality. Now, before, just I want to make this comment that before we had the Hindu Arabic 
way of writing numbers and were writing numbers in the, in the Roman way, doing division and divisibility must have been very, very difficult. It was quite a challenge. And Abacus was helpful, but even with that, it was quite a challenge to do these operations. So now, so let's just step back and see what we did. We talked about natural numbers, we talked about division, and we talked about divisibility. And now we are ready for a fundamental definition about what are prime numbers. And here it is, uh, an integer number P is prime if its only divisors are one and P. Extremely simple definition connected to divisibility of numbers. And let's muse a little bit here. So let's ask a few questions. First, we will show some examples. Then I will try to make, to understand what makes prime numbers special. And then we want to see how many prime numbers do we have? And how can we tell whether a number is prime or not? And is there some formula for giving us prime numbers? And then we should also consider the usefulness of all this. So to give examples, all these numbers are prime. One is clearly prime because its only divisor is one. Two is prime because it can be divided only by two by itself and by one. Same about say 11. If you try to divide 11 by any number smaller, you have to only look about, think about smaller numbers. It doesn't divide, cannot be divided by two, cannot be divided in three, not in four, not in five, not in six. So 11 is prime. Its only divisors are one and itself. Same for all these other numbers. And the list goes on. So these are all the primes less than 50. By contrast, if I take, say, 42, well, 42 is clearly divisible by 2 because it ends in 2. It actually, it's twice 21. So 42 is not prime. Or if I take, say, 28, 28 is 4 times 7. So it's not prime. So all the other numbers smaller than 50 are not prime. And so here is a distinction between prime numbers and not prime numbers. <clears throat> here is, I just remember a joke from my youth. As young, arrogant mathematicians, we tell this joke about engineers. And an engineer would claim that the prime numbers are two and all the odd numbers. And the mathematician will ask for a proof and the engineer will say, well, two is prime, right? Yes, it is. Okay, let's look at one, three, five, seven. They are prime. Yes, they are. Nine, oh, nine is not prime. Eh, probably just some error from measurement from the experimental setup. Let's go on. 11, 13 are prime. Let's take some random samples, 17, 23, 37, 43 are prime. So the engineer would, would say overwhelming evidence that the prime numbers are two and all the odd numbers. So this is the third joke about how we viewed engineers as arrogant young mathematicians. But back, back to mathematics. We have here the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And this theorem says that every integer greater than one can be represented uniquely as a product of prime numbers. Unique up to the order of the factors. So we, we can do, to write them in different order, but other than that, it's a unique way to factor a number. So for example, 60 is two times two times three times five. 
And that's the only way to write a factorization of 60 using prime numbers. We have to have two twos, one three, and one five. And in the same vein, take any number, it's either prime, or if not, you can factor it uniquely. And so what this tells us, now if you think of it, it tells us that prime numbers are important because any other number can be expressed in terms of prime numbers, in terms of prime numbers. So prime numbers are uh, the building blocks of all the integer numbers. The result was probably known well before Euclid, at least at some intuitive level, because people did multiplication. But we always refer to Euclid for the first formal statement and proof. And that is in book seven of Elements, where Euclid really does number theory. He thinks he's doing geometry, but he is really doing number theory. And then in this book, he is not giving axioms, he's giving definitions and then some propositions. And just to give you a flavor, definition number 11 says, a prime number is that which is measured by a unit alone. So he is measuring for him a number, the unit is a segment and the, of which he takes as a unit. And a prime number can be measured, meaning that you couldn't take any other segment to measure the prime number, to measure that. What he means is that there is no way to divide a segment in equal segments, there is only one way to divide that. In our modern terminology, a prime number is that which is divisible only by one. And then in proposition 30, he says, if two numbers multiplied by one another make some number and any prime number measures the product, then it also measures one of the original numbers. In modern terminology, much simpler to understand, if A is a prime number, B divides, no, sorry. If a prime, num if a prime number P divides the product A times B, then P divides either A or B or possibly both. And so this, is really a very, very simple to understand. If you have a product, then the prime number is a fact of prime number that divides the result. It has to divide either one or the other. This we call Euclid's lemma. And it's very important because we use it to prove the uniqueness part of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And proposition 32 says any number is either prime or is measured by some prime number. In modern terminology, we would say a number A is either prime or is divisible by some prime number. And he proves this. This is used to prove the existence part of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And here is the argument. If I take a number, I want to show that I can factor it as a product of primes. And here is a proof. If A is prime, there is nothing to do because it's prime. But if it's not prime, then by definition, it can be divided by some prime number, P1. So then I take A1 to be A divided by P. So A is P1 times A1. And now I do some sort of induction downward mathematical induction, P1 is prime, but A1 is smaller than A, so by induction can be show, can be written as a product of primes. And going on, repeating this argument, we get that A has a prime factorization. So this is some sort of descending mathematical induction. So never mind, all I wanted to 
do here is prove, uh, argue that any number can be uh, factored, written as a product of prime numbers. So here is now another proof for the existence of existence of a factorization now strictly by mathematical induction. So the statement is true for n. Now assume that the statement that factorization exists is true for all the numbers from two to n minus one. And I want to prove it for n. If n is prime, there is nothing to prove. If n is not prime, then I can write it as a factor of two other numbers. But now n1 and n2 are smaller than n, so the induction hypothesis can be applied to them. They can be written as a product of prime primes. So then n itself is a product of primes. And so never mind, I won't go into uniqueness. So we just wanted to understand how prime numbers are the building block of all the natural numbers using uh, multiplication. So now I just have a, a, a little aside, I muse about things that are obvious. Sometimes in, they are intuitively obvious, and yet when we want to prove them rigorously, we have to make a delicate proof. And also another uh, thing is things are building up. So we just started with natural numbers, which is easy. Division is easy. The definition of prime numbers is easy. But now we got into things we are, which are not so easy anymore. So for instance, here's a statement which is true. If A and we call A and B relatively prime, if they have no common factor other than one. And so the, the, the theorem says that if we have A and B relatively prime, then we can find X and Y such that AX plus BY equals one. And this is not obvious at all. And yet we hardly did any we hardly got away from the, from the definition of numbers and divisibility, and we are already talking of things which are not obvious. And I won't prove this. I just wanted to give an example of how things build up. And so here, I just give an example for what I told before. Eight and 21 are relatively prime, meaning that they don't have any common divisors. Eight is two times two times two, and 21 is three times seven, so nothing in common except one. And I can make eight, I can find X and Y such that AX plus 21Y equals one. And what are those numbers? X is eight and Y is minus three. And indeed, eight times eight minus 21 times three is 64 minus 63 is one. And so here is an example of something that is not obvious, which uh, just came out of the, uh, hardly, we hardly did a little mathematics and we already have interesting statements. And another thing that is not obvious is the existence of least common multi multiple and greatest common divisor. Children in middle school are learning about these things and they find them complicated with good reason. A few words about Euclid's elements. It's such a great work and so fundamental that I, I think I talked about it in other lectures, but I want, I will repeat myself a little bit. So Euclid lived around 300 BC in Alexandria, and we know very little about him, which is unusual because from that period, there are other science, other philosophers, scholars, about whom we know more. We have, we know about Euclid mostly from references about him from other people. Papus of Alexandria in the fourth century, Proclus in the fifth century, so much later, hundreds of years later, 
they were mentioning Euclid. Arab scholars in the 9th, 10th, 11th century were talking of Euclid and of his works. Euclid is best known for the elements, but from references to him, we know that there are other works that he wrote and they are completely lost and we don't know what they were. Now the elements is important because it was the first effort of doing mathematics based on an axiomatic system. Before that, people do, did mathematics, and not only in, in Greece, but in China, in India, in Babylon, but they were doing things in a, in a practical way, just doing them. But Euclid in Elements said, we have to set axioms and everything can be deduced from the axioms. Elements really contains geometry, algebra, and number theory, but everything is expressed in geometric terms. <clears throat> the original of the elements is lost. We don't have any uh, pieces of the original manuscript. What we have is a copy of it from much, much later, from fourth century, by Theon of Alexandria, who will come up in our, his name will come up in our next lecture. Uh, he had a copy, wrote a copy, and uh, this was the copy that survived, and this, based on this, uh, we, there were made uh, publications much later throughout the Arab world and uh, in Europe, until in 1808, when at the Vatican, a manuscript was discovered, which was not a copy of Theon's version, but it was a, was a manuscript from uh, around 900 from a Byzantine workshop. I want to show uh, a picture here. Let's see if it comes up. Just a picture of yeah. This is a fragment of <clears throat> a manuscript from a papyrus uh, which exists uh, today. You can, if you are, I won't go through the, where it is, and, but it's a fragment of a manuscript of a copy of the elements. <clears throat> Let me close this and minimize this and get back to our lecture. The first Latin translation was by Boetius from around 500, and the first known translation into Arabic, what we know of, was done under Harun al-Rashid around 800 from a copy from the Byzantium. And although known in the Byzantium, the element was lost to Western Europe, so that Byzantium is nowadays uh, Asia Minor, Turkey, but knowledge when was lost to Western Europe till around 1120, when an English monk, Adelar of Bath, translated it into Latin from an Arabic version, an Arabic translation. The first printed edition was done by this German printer in Venice in 1482. This was very soon after the invention of the movable metal type printing was uh, discovered. The element has by nowadays has been translated into many languages and it is believed that 
over a thousand editions have been printed. Some people say that next to the Bible, the Elements is the most widely spread book in the civilization of the Western world. It is said, I read someplace, that Abraham Lincoln kept a copy of the Elements in his saddlebag and often, when he had time, just took it out and studied it. And he said, you can never make a lawyer if you do not understand what demonstrate means. For him, the elements was important because it was teaching him how to demonstrate things. And I think this is my la last page of history about the elements. This remains a basic text in mathematics until the 19th century. Everybody who studied mathematics had to read not the whole thing, but at least parts of it. it. In spite of the elements being such a great work, it's not perfect. The axiom, some axioms are not stated explicitly, just assumed, and there are small errors, but its spirit is the one that matters, and uh, that spirit really uh, changed how we do science. And here I have a few more uh, pictures. I want to show this one from Wikipedia. There's some nice pictures of copies of manuscripts. So here is a beautiful uh, copy of first English version of Euclid's elements, beautifully printed. And here are this fragment that we saw before, and here is a copy. So I just bring up this page and you can bring it up at your leisure and look at the pictures and read more about the elements and its history. <clears throat> so, to go on, oops, I clicked on a link by mistake, that, by the way, that link, linked this uh, second link here, I have three links, the second one from Clark University. It's uh, beautiful, it's not interesting, not no pictures, but this uh, professor actually went through it and has each proposition uh, stated as, as Euclid stated it and then translates it into modern terminology and has comments on the proof. It's an amazing piece of work. So now to go on, let's get back to prime numbers. So I convinced you that there is something magic in prime numbers, that they are, it's, they are the building block of all the other numbers and they are so curious and interesting. So let's, I, I, I stated some questions. One of the questions was how many prime numbers are there? Just a certain like a quantity, say one million or a thousand or infinitely many. And the answer comes from this theory. There are infinitely many prime numbers. And actually this is, Proposition 20 in book nine of the elements, it says prime numbers are more than any assigned multitude of prime numbers. This is how Euclid wanted to express that there are infinitely many. You take any assigned multitude and then you have more numbers than that. And the proof is so simple. There are many proofs to this, but I have one that's here that's so simple and so elegant that I will just give it. So here is a proof. Let's assume that we only have finitely many prime numbers. If you have only finitely many, list them all, P1, P2, and so on to Pn. And these are all the prime numbers, no more. 
Okay, then let's consider this number big P equals the product of P1 times P2 times P3 times Pn, product of all the primes, plus one. Now, this P is not divisible by any of the prime numbers listed, because if I try to do the division, I get the remainder one. That means that this P must be prime itself. But that's a contradiction because I listed all these numbers and now I found one that is bigger than them. So this contradiction shows that there are infinitely many prime numbers. The assumption that there were only finitely many of them is false. Okay, next question then is the prime numbers then I looked I started listing all those numbers from one to 50. You could notice that I have one, two, three, five, seven, but then they start became, becoming more sparse. And as you go into larger and larger numbers, they are becoming more and more sparse. And Mathematicians trying to answer, to understand how, how, how are they distributed? What is this sparseness? Great Euler commented, mathematicians have tried in vain to this day to discover some order in the sequence of prime numbers. And we have reason to believe that it is a mystery into which the mind will never penetrate. And this contemporary mathematician, Don Zegier, stated, in the writing of his, there are two facts about the distribution of prime numbers, about how they are distributed among the other numbers. The first is that despite their simple definition and the role as a building blocks, the prime numbers grow like weeds among the natural numbers, seeming to obey no other law than that of chance. And nobody can predict where the next one next prime number will sprout. The second fact is even more astonishing, for it states just the opposite. The prime numbers exhibit stunning regularity, that there are precise laws governing their behavior. So let's just review what we did so far. We just talked about natural numbers, then, of course, we did addition and multiplication and division. Then we talked a little bit about divisibility and we defined prime numbers. So far, so good. And then the prime numbers turned out to be the building blocks of integer numbers. And now the question that I brought up is, how are they distributed among the integers? And curiously, to give such to give an answer to this very simple elementary question, we will need calculus, so <clears throat> even complex analysis. So I want to take a break of say five minutes. It's uh, 10.58, so at 11.03, let's resume and we'll go on to the next half of this lecture. So until then, are there any questions? <clears throat> I have a question. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure this is an original question, but, but it's something I don't know. If it, it, it's, it's stated and you've stated uh, that there is no pattern to the prime numbers that uh, you can't predict where the next one will be. Yes. Is there a mathematical proof that no such pattern can exist or can ever be found? Or is it just that we haven't found it yet? Uh, the, the, there is no, no, as far as I know, there is no proof that there is no pattern. But the evidence is so strong that uh, uh, people just take it for granted that there is no, no real pattern, unlike say it's not a geometric progression or some sort, you will, I will state, I will have a statement that says that you, you may formulate, reformulate your question as, is there a formula giving us 
all the prime numbers or a formula giving us prime numbers or a method. And interestingly, very curiously, I was surprised to hear that the answer is yes. So there are ways I won't, they are so complicated that I won't even state them here. I will give a link though to just, uh, if you are curious, to see uh, such statements. And that will come up in one of my slides. But uh, so you may say that, yes, that's a pattern. Yeah. But it, it's a pattern that's it's extremely impractical and difficult to grasp. What I will show is that the pattern is, uh, there is no precise pattern, and yet there is, uh, as I will see, there is some, some regularity about how the prime numbers, uh, not so how much show, show up, but how many there are. I, I actually have another question, although yes, somebody else. I uh, did. Did the Greeks? What What was the Greek number system like? Was it just like the Roman one, and or or do, do, do what What kind of numbers did the Greeks use? I've never really seen that. Uh, you know, I don't know. That's a very good question. Very interesting question. I don't know. Uh, and we don't, uh, well, it's interesting that in some previous, I remember in some lecture I mentioned how Babylonians were, the Babylonians used, uh, not a 10 based system, but a 16 based system or a six, uh, and they used cuneiform. Yeah. And we know that the, Hebrews used the letters for representing numbers, but I don't know what the Greeks used to represent numbers. <laughs> oh, I will make my present my viewer big again we are in presentation mode so would it would it be any effort just to go back one slide i don't know how your I, thing is I, okay I, thank I you just go doing that so i oh. <laughs> was doing that because i want to see what where are we going next we are going to answer how the numbers are distributed among the integer numbers. So we want to see some, that we want to discover that there is some regularity, some law governing prime numbers, and we want to express to, to look at that. It will be an extremely simple statement. I will give the theorem later. But to give that statement, I need to get back into calculus just a little bit, not too, not too much. Don't get intimidated. We have to start talking about logarithm, the logarithm function. And now the logarithm function, I will define it formally, but, and I will talk about it a little bit. 
but I, I, we don't need any deep understanding. All I really need is to be able to refer to it. To refer to it, I want to talk about it first. So the notion of logarithm, <coughs> if somebody asks you, what is logarithm? You probably most likely wouldn't know. I mean, the average uh, college educated person wouldn't know how to explain just in, in what, what is logarithm. A mathematician would know what to say, but uh, other people wouldn't. And so, but it's not foreign to us. We use the word and we use it. And sometimes we even in the media. So sometimes we talk of something being on a logarithmic scale. And what does that really mean? Here I'm, I'm showing a graph which is shown on logarithmic scale. And what this means, this is taken from, from Wikipedia. You see on the horizontal axis, we just have the years 1901, 05, 1909. I think it's, or I don't know. I, I can't, they are too small for me. I can't read them. But we do have just uh, arithmetically increasing uh, scale. But on the vertical axis, we go not additively, but multiplicatively. We have a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, a million, ten million, and so on. The vertical axis is on a logarithmic scale, not on an arithmetic scale. So you do see such graphs occasionally. <clears throat> now, talking of logarith logarithm, mathematicians refer to it as an elementary function. And another elementary function is the exponential function. Others are the trigonometric, but I don't want to get into that. Now I'm talking of the exponential and logarithm. And just explaining these functions and studying their properties could be a whole lecture in itself. Here I'm just trying to quickly go by. Talking of exponentials, you are familiar with, even if you know how to define it, you are familiar with uh, the word. People sometimes talk of exponential growth. And what they mean is something grows very, very fast. Now, the definitions of exponential growth and logarithmic growth and logarithm and logarithmic scale, they are a little bit technical and I'll go through them quickly but don't, don't uh, get intimidated and you will be able, even if you don't understand the details, you will be able to get what I am going to say next. So here I'm giving the formal definition. I put the title logarithm because that's my aim, but I'm really giving the formal definition of an exponential function, b to the power x. And the way that's defined is we know by what b to the n means when n is a natural number. It just means multiply b by itself n times. b to the zero is defined as one, and b to a negative number is defined as one over b to the n. b to a fraction is defined like this, and then b to the x is defined as the limit of b to the xn, where xn is a sequence approaching x. So this is the formal definition, but never mind that, just pretend that b to the x is something familiar, and it's the exponential function. Now the logarithmic function is the inverse. We say that given a number b, not one, and given a number x, the logarithm in base b of x is the number y such that b to the y gives x. So it's the inverse of the b to the y is the exponential, it gives us x. The way we write this is that log y equals log b x, log in base b 
of x. So y equals log in base b of x means b to the y equals x. So this is the formal definition, and this is it. Now we know it. Now we can legally talk about it. A few examples. Log in base 2 of 8 is 3. And why is that? Because 2 to the 3, 2 to the third power is 8. Log in base 10 of 100 is 2. And that's because the base to the second power, 10 to the second power, is 100. Log in base b of b to the n is n. That comes directly from the definition. Log in base b of b is 1. And log in base b of 1 is always 0, because b to the 0 is 1. So these are just examples. And it's a little, can be a little, if you don't, didn't get these details, never mind. You'll be perfect, you'll perfectly understand what comes next. <clears throat> Just to express that they are inverse to each other, I write that log of x of log of exponential of x is x, and the exponential of log of x is x. This expresses that they are inverse functions to each other. But an extremely important use of logarithms is that Logarithm allows us to do addition instead of multiplication. And that comes from this property. The log in base b of x times y is log in base b of x plus log in base b of y. That comes from this formula from exponentials. And I show you how this is useful. Let's assume that somebody already prepared a huge table of logarithm values. So for any number, you can look up its logarithm, and for any logarithm, for any result, you can look up the exponential. So now let's assume you have two numbers, x and y, that you want to multiply. Instead of multiplying them directly, you can do the following. Get a, which is log x, using those tables, just look up the x and get the value of a, do the same, get b as log y, do the addition of a and b, and now use the table the other way to get the value x times y. And this is truly useful. This is, can, it, it's used, it has been used for a while, and it's used even today, because it's much easier to make addition than multiplication. This method was invented by John Napier, proposed in 1614 in a book he wrote, Mirifici Logarithmorum Canonis Descriptio. He didn't know about logarithms. He actually had this intuition of creating these useful tables which allow people to do addition instead of multiplication. We'll get back to this historical fact a little later. So now I don't get more, I don't want to get more into logarithm and its definition and operations with it. What is interesting to us is, just want to mention one thing here. The three logarithm in base B, any B, you can take any B to be the base. The three useful bases are logarithm in base two, in base 10, and in base e, e is that magical number that I already mentioned, I think in lecture one and in other lectures too, it's about 2.7, and it's called the Euler's number. And in some sense, this is the most natural number to take as a base for logarithms. To such an extent that mathematicians and engineers and physicists are using e by default, and they have a ln. Instead of writing log, they write ln for natural logarithm. They call this a natural logarithm. So going on, what I am interested in what to do for this lecture is to show 
the behavior, how does the logarithm function behave? And here I show the three graphs, log two of x, natural logarithm, and log in base 10 of x. And you can see that they all have the same shape. They start from minus infinity, close to zero. They are only defined for real numbers. They start, they are very close to minus infinity when x is close to zero. They are all equal to zero when the value x is one. And they all grow to infinity as x go, goes out to infinity. They go at a different rate, but in an extremely similar fashion. <clears throat> Now a few words about John Napier. He lived between 1550 and 1617. He was not a formal scholar, not a formal mathematician. He was a Scottish landowner and he lived on his estate and in his free time, he liked to do mathematics and physics, experiments and astronomy. And he did that all on, in, so mostly in isolation, not, not uh, Cambridge, uh, like uh, Oxford, I think they already existed, but he wasn't at a university. He was just doing, taking care of his estate and studying his interest. His interest in mathematics was he was, tried to ease the burden of making computations. And he recognized and promoted the use of these tables, these decimal. First of all, he realized the importance of the decimal positional system. The Hebrew Arabic numbers were already widespread, but not completely accepted yet. And he was promoting it, that if this is the way to write numbers. But then, so he also worked in theology and some his neighbor, neighbors, sometimes saw that he, he was in, in uh, uh, connecting with the devil because who knows what he's doing in that room of his late at night. But he was just doing his stuff. He wrote this book, which contained 57 pages of explanations on how to do uh, operations and these 90 pages of tables he was referring to to be used for comp for making computations he coined the word logarithm which comes from ratio number logos which is proportion ratio or word and arithmos which is number so the no name logarithm comes from him he took 20 years to compile the text and compute the tables. And his invention was accepted and adopted very quickly and very widely. He implicitly, not knowing about the number E, his tables were really expressing logarithms in base E, the natural logarithms. It was much later, in the same century, in 1683, Jacob Bernoulli, who actually discovered E, indirectly he was doing computations related to compound interest. And he realized that this number plays some special role in those computations of compound interest. It was really Euler in 1730 who uh, decided that there is this number E, and put the, talked about the exponential function and logarithm function and put it all in the context that we have to this day. So now <clears throat> I want to go back to log and to the question that's interesting to us. So limit as x goes to infinity of log x is infinity. Okay, that's good. We know that, we understand that, it's not easy to see at least, on the, it's not difficult to see at least on the graph. But then the question is how fast, how fast does it go to infinity? And thinking of what I mentioned, exponential growth, logarithmic growth, polynomial growth, 
how does this grow to infinity compared to those? And that's what I am trying to answer in the next few slides. So to answer how fast or slowly, I can only make comparisons. There is no definition other than showing the functions or uh, giving these functions as models. Now in the media, you heard about exponential growth, polynomial growth, linear growth. Okay? And I have an aside that I'm convinced that many people use these without really knowing what they mean. And I have my little aside that marketing is a very respectable profession, but its practitioners are very prone to using these terms. And I have two stories. One, when I was working at Sun Microsystems, which by the way was a great company, the marketing people decided this logo, we had the logo for a while, take it to the ends. It's, well, to me, it was, to us engineers, it was very fuzzy. What, what do they mean, take it to the ends? Presumably, something at Sun will grow like a polynomial of degree n. And is this good or great or what does this really say? That was never made clear. And even worse case is what people often refer to as Moore's law. And Moore was a very respectable executive a very great company. And he stated that the power of computer chips doubles about every two years. And people refer to this as Moore's law. And this is really nonsense. It is plain nonsense. Nothing can double every two years because then soon there would be, that's impossible. It can't double to infinity. It can double for a few years and then that's it. People nowadays say Moore's law doesn't apply anymore. Well, then it's not a law, I would argue. So back to the growth of functions. I want to show here, I'm growing, showing this function y equals x. And this is this straight line in the middle of this quadrant. Below that, I'm showing y equals square root of x. And even below that, I show y equals logarithm of x. My point is that square root of x grows much, much, they all grow to infinity, no question about that. But square root of x grows much slower than x, and log x grows much slower than square root of x. On the other side, I am looking at y equals x squared, which grows much faster than y equals x, and then I am looking at y equals e to the x, exponential of x, which grows even faster than this polynomial. So I'm just showing, I can't go far enough. I would have to have a huge display to show how much faster each of these graphs goes than the other, or how much slower, if you will look to the logarithm. <clears throat> so they are all growing to infinity. And now what I want to compare specifically is y equals x and then log x. So log x grows to infinity, but lo limit of x minus log x also grows to infinity, meaning that the exponential, that the linear function x grows much, much faster than the logarithm function, or the other way, the logarithm function grows much, much slower. And that I express in a different way by taking the ratio x over log x. The limit of this ratio, they both x and both log x go to infinity but x go, grows faster and log grows slow and the ratio itself grows to infinity. And so it's this fraction that I want to concentrate on. Talking of, talking of exponential growth, I want to tell this story, the legend 
the inventor of chess is offered compensation by the king for this wonderful game of chess. He asks and he says, what would you like to get? And uh, he modestly says, well, just give me one grain of wheat to be placed on the first square of the board and two grains on the second and four grains on the third and so on, double the grains and place the double number of grains on the successive squares of the board. And the king laughs, ha <laughs> ha, so modest, so cheap, so, such a cheap prize. And then the court treasurers come and report that the number of grains is so huge that they are all going bankrupt. And then the king, it's not, the uh, legend has different variations in one, the king makes this uh, inventor of the chess, game of chess a high-ranking advisor. In another, he's so angry that he has him executed. Uh, nowadays, we can do the computation. The number of grains would be 2 to the 64 minus 1, which is these many grains, which if you put them all together and weigh them, it would be 1.4 trillion metric tons of grain which is about 2,000 times the annual world production of wheat for this period. I didn't do these computations myself. I hope they are true. I just took them from the internet, but everybody agrees that this is such a huge number that nobody would be able to pay such a price. So this just gives us a feel for how fast the exponential is growing. By contrast, this is how slowly the logarithm is growing. So all these qualifications of growth, are they important? So of course they are interesting to mathematicians and to computer scientists, but they are also very important, practically speaking, in computer science, because all in computer science, many algorithms that we decide, the, uh, that we use in everyday life depend on some n and we want to know the complexity, how fast the computational needs are growing. So for instance, the famous traveling salesman problem, a salesman has to travel between n cities go going through each, everyone. Which way should he go? to have an optimal route. This is today, the UPS truck has to, the driver needs to define, he has many packages to deliver, he has to define which way, in what order should he deliver them, so he drives, uh, not, doesn't drive around uh, too much. Or, we are solving systems of N equations and N unknowns all the time in engineering. What method should we have so that as the systems get larger and larger with n, uh, the algorithm is manageable? Or in, in today with all the navigation and, and space travel, we have n astronomical bodies. We want to describe their trajectory we taking in account all the gravitational forces. For accuracy, we should take in account more and more bodies because they influence each other. The list of examples of how many algorithms, it could just go on and on. And practically, it's extremely important if an algorithm has exponential growth, it's not even worth looking at. I mean, it could be interesting mathematically, but practically has no value. Polynomial growth is more acceptable depending on the degree of polynomial. If something has degree growth with n cube, that's not good enough because that goes too fast. The computational complexity is unacceptable. Growth like n log n or linear growth or logarithmic growth, that's good. That's what 
we hope to find. And now to the aim of this lecture. The prime counting function pi of x is defined by this very simple statement. Pi of x is the number of prime numbers less or equal than x. So for instance, pi of five is four because there are four numbers less than five, one, four primes, one, two, three, and five. Well, pi of seven is five because there are five numbers less than seven. And so this pi number, pi counting, prime counting function is very simple. Just count the number of primes up to x. And the great theorem, the prime number theorem, says that the limit as x goes to infinity of pi of x divided by x over log x is one. That as x goes to infinity, this ratio is one. And so this has something that's so beautiful in it. On the top, we have something for which all we need is integers, divisibility, and counting. Nothing else. It's completely elementary. At the denominator, we have the logarithmic function, we have the growth of this function, and the limit of these two things as x goes to infinity is one. And so I, of course, I won't prove this. I will now just make comments, give examples, talk about it. <clears throat> but this was basically the aim of the lecture, to be able to make this beautiful statement. So the way we phrase this, maybe mathematicians say pi of x grows like x over log x. Sometimes we just write it this way, pi of x, we don't write equal, we put this sign, trivial sign, that it's x, same growth as x over log x. But the moment we have such a theorem, we immediately have questions. Are there other theorems which give similar results or even better results? Are there, how fast is this growth to infinity? How big is the difference? And so here is one statement. Pi of the limit of pi of x over, here we don't take x over log x. Instead, we take integral from two to the x of one over log t dt. So this brings in integral calculus. We compute this integral as x goes bigger and bigger. This integral changes value and gets bigger and bigger. And the way the result grows is the same as the way pi of x grows. So this is actually, turns out, uh, even a better, mathematically speaking, a better, it's a little bit more complicated than this one, but it is a better approximation of pi of x. Now let me show some pictures. Here I am showing a picture comparing these two functions. So here is one. Here is a graph of pi of x over x over log x. And you can see first it grows a little bit, then it starts decreasing, it decreasing, and as x approaches infinity, this gets closer and closer and closer to one. By contrast, this other in ratio, here I take pi of x over the integral from two to the x over of one over log t dt, this approaches one so fast, this is not equal to one, but the graph is not detailed enough to show how close 
this function is to one. So you can see how much faster it approaches one. So in some sense, it is a much, this integral is a much better approximation of pi of x here on the uh, horizontal axis. We see, <clears throat> we go by increments of 10,000 of, uh, no, sorry. Yeah, of 10, no, this is a logarithmic scale with a increment of 10,000. So first we get to 10 to the fourth, that's 10,000 and multiply that by 10 to the fourth, we get to 10 to the eighth, 10 to the 12th, and 10 to the 24, that's a huge number. So this graph, whoever did it, really did lots of computations, of course, on a computer. To show another graph, this is taken from mathworld.wolfram.com. This compares four functions. The four functions are pi of n, this integral I was talking about, li of n, the integral from two to the n of one over log t over dt, then it takes this n log n, the one we mentioned, and then it takes this function I didn't mention until now, which is n over log n minus this number. And we, we can see, so the, the <clears throat> four functions, how they grow, n log n over log n is a little bit of an outlier. They are all very good approximations to pi of n. So pi of n is the blue one. It's this one, the third one. Li of n is that one. The fraction is the green one, and the red one is n log n. So you see, they're all really close to pi of n, but those two are closer than n log n. <clears throat> but n log n is still the most elegant. So now related questions to the prime number theorem. I'm just stating them. I won't, I won't attempt to answer them. So one question is how quickly does this approach one? And there are theorems about all these which are interesting and intriguing. I'm just asking the questions right now. So can we say anything? Okay, we talked about the ratio pi over n over that. Can we say anything about the difference pi over n minus n over log n? Is it large? Is it going to infinity or it's bounded? And is it positive or negative? Do we know anything about whether pi of n is smaller or bigger than n? over log n, or at least after some threshold. So the same questions are interesting, not only for n over log n, but for the other functions I showed in the previous graph. And then are there other interesting functions similar to pi of n related to the counting function? And there are very many interesting theorems and I won't go into those. I'm just mentioning that there is a lot of stuff further on in, on this topic. Now, a little bit of history. When was this theorem, the prime number theorem, first uh, stated? It was first conjectured, conjectured in the 1790s, which is quite amazing. It's quite early in time when calculus wasn't so well developed yet. Now Gauss, by his own account, claimed that he conjectured it in 1792 when he was 15 years old. We tend to believe Gauss, he was a serious mathematician and extremely gifted. And it is, if true, it's amazing. Whether he really stated it or not, we don't know. In any case, this Russian mathematician, Chebyshev, and Riemann, the German mathematician whom I talked about, they independently make very big steps 
toward, uh, towards understanding the distribution of prime numbers in the middle of the 19th century. So they already knew the statement, they didn't prove it, but they made very big steps which were fundamental in later people finding the proof. It was these two French mathematicians who independently published proofs in 1896. The proofs were built on insights from Riemann and used complex analysis. So that's again an amazing thing that you need complex analysis to prove such a simple statement. In the 20th century, people wanted to find an elementary proof. Now, what is elementary? That's a debatable thing. Elementary would mean, in some people's definition, that a first-year college student who is majoring in mathematics should be able to follow and understand it. That you don't need graduate school knowledge in order to understand the proof. So in 20th century, an elementary proof, several elementary proofs were found, and they did not use complex analysis at all, but they were extremely technical. And then another, another achievement was to find a short proof. And the much shorter proof was found in 1980, but this one uses complex analysis. So uh, I, my personal recollection is I did have a course in graduate school in mathematics uh, where we had analytic number theory and there I saw a proof and it was based on complex analysis and it was quite complicated. So just talking about prime numbers now, we don't have to make any, any more statements and definitions. So how to find prime numbers? So this uh, kind of takes us to Roger's question. Is there a formula or uh, something that generates numbers? So of course you can always take a number, do try to do all the possible divisions and decide whether it's prime or not. And then this is a way of finding prime numbers. But is there Anything better, the better way to check whether a number is prime? And yes, there are better ways. They are quite complicated, but there are better ways for checking whether a number is prime or not. And now, are there formulas or methods which you say, if I follow these steps, the number I get is prime? And surprisingly, the answer is yes. And the next question is are there formulas or methods which would generate all the prime numbers. So you say, if I follow this step by step, I get prime after prime after prime, but you get all the prime numbers. And again, the answer is yes. But these are all so complicated that they are uninteresting, both from theoretical and from practical point of view. Uh -huh. I thought I made a slide by giving some links. I didn't, maybe I will add that later. Another question now, practical questions. Is there any use of prime numbers? Or is it just a game that we mathematicians like to play? And surprisingly, prime numbers are really very important. So important that in 1994, a US patent was issued for somebody, somebody who discovered two very large primes that people didn't know before that, that those two very large numbers were primes. There are other uses in computer science and in mathematics about uh, in certain computations, and I won't go into those, they, they can be technical. The other use of prime numbers is just simply the interest in primes generated so many theories and so many, uh, so much research in mathematics that those theorems and research is useful in itself, in physics, in technology, 
and engineering. And then the quest for verifying statements about prime numbers is such a, an intriguing thing that pushed the boundaries of computer science. And now I want to talk about conjectures, a few just for fun, Con conjectures about prime numbers. What is a conjecture? Conjecture is a statement which mathematicians believe to be true, but nobody knows how to prove it. One of the most famous conjectures in mathematics is called Riemann's hypothesis. And it's called a hypothesis, but it's really a conjecture. And it's about a certain very simple complex function, which is called the Riemann's zeta function. And the conjecture is about which are the points in the complex plane where this is zero. And this, it's a little too technical, so I won't go into it, but it's one of the most famous conjectures in mathematics. I already mentioned this in lecture one. But now to mention some conjectures about prime numbers. One famous conjecture is a, what we call the Goldbach conjecture. The conjecture states that every integer bigger than two can be written as the sum of two prime numbers. So for example, four is two plus two. Eight is three plus five. 20 can be written as a sum in two ways, 3 plus 17 or 7 plus 13. Now this conjecture is surprising, because on the one hand, prime numbers are so sparse that you would imagine that for huge even number, uh, you may not be able to find two primes which add up to give that even number. But on the other hand, uh, there are still enough of them so that even number is the sum of two primes. In any case, nobody knows how to prove this. The statement was first stated in 1742, so that's uh, more than 200 years ago, where a Le Le Euler, Leonard Euler was writing to his friend Christian Goldbach, reminding him that Goldbach actually stated this in an earlier conversation. Nowadays, the conjecture was verified on computers numerically for all the numbers up to four times 10 to the 18th, which is a huge number. So definitely there is evidence that this is true, but we don't know how to prove it. Another intriguing conjecture is the twin primes conjecture. The conjecture says, that, so first let me just say what twin primes are. Twin primes are pairs of prime numbers which differ by two. So for instance, three and five, there are two prime numbers differing by two. 17 and 19, two prime numbers differing by two. 41 and 43, two prime numbers which differ just by two. 20, 71 and 73. So the conjecture is that there are infinitely such pairs. So this is again startling because on the one hand, the prime numbers become so sparse that you would say, what are the chances of two numbers differing by two? On the other hand, prime numbers are so many that you would say, oh yes, no, far, how far I, no matter how far I go, I will have prime numbers which differ by two. The largest known pair of twin primes is this. This number, which is two trillion, I believe. No, no two quadrillion, 1996 trillion, this many, no, trillions, billions, millions, times two to the, this huge power. So you take this plus one, and this minus one, they both turn out to be prime. This was discovered, of course, by computers in September 2016. And it has been shown that if you take all the numbers up to 
10 to the power 18, which is a huge number, then there are this many pairs of twin primes. So this is a very, <clears throat> very intriguing conjecture. And one last conjecture before I finish. Let's talk about Fermat numbers. This came up in one of my other lectures in, in geometry. I had uh, some lectures in geometry. And there, these numbers came up. This Fermat played with this. Fermat was this uh, lawyer, I talked about him earlier in this series. Lawyer, a mature mathematician. He played with numbers and he looked at these numbers, two to the two to the n. Now these are increasing enormously fast because two to the n increases extremely fast. And then two to that result increases very fast and then, then take plus one. And the first few numbers are three. That's for zero. You get two to the zero is one. Two to the one is two plus one makes three. For n equals one, you get two to the two. Two to the one is two. Two to the two is four. Four plus one is five. So the first few are three, five, seventeen, two fifty-seven, sixty-five thousand five hundred thirty-seven. This huge number and then this even huger number. Now, curiously, the first five numbers, one, two, three, four, five, these first five are prime. This is not prime, and this is not prime. And it is believed that no other numbers except the first five are prime. And this was verified for n up to 32. And that's a huge number. So. Again, we believe this to be true, but we have no proof for it. And finally, my last, my last remark is that the quest, so people are intrigued by prime numbers and we want to find a larger and larger and larger prime number. And what is the largest prime number known today? The largest prime number known today is two to the power 82,589,933 minus one. It has this many digits. And this was discovered in 2018. I mean, somebody took the number and verified that it's prime. And the quest for higher and higher prime numbers goes on. And among mathematicians, whoever discovers, and even actually more com like computer scientists, whoever discovers a a uh, bigger number has, has an achievement, like a life achievement. This quest for larger and larger prime numbers is similar to the quest for finding more and more digits of pi or of e. And they led to very big advances in mathematics and computer science. So let's review what we did. We defined prime numbers which was quite simple. Then we talked about the prime factorization theorem about and about the fact that there are infinitely many primes. Then we looked at the logarithm function. And then we discussed this prime number theorem. We stated it and discussed it about the distribution of primes. And we wrapped up with a discussion about the theorem and open questions. For next time, I will just have a lecture with hardly no mathematics in it. Most, I mean, you can't avoid to read women, portraits of women mathematicians. So I will have to mention some mathematics, but it will be mostly about their lives and achievements. And a little food for thought. Again, just not, nothing mathematical, but what is it in human nature that makes us so interested in studying things like prime numbers? And in the same vein, 
we want to know the universe and we want to know, or we are collecting stamps or we are doing lots of things that are really not immediately useful, but there is some quest for achieving something. With prime understanding prime numbers is such a quest. What is it in our human nature that makes us have quests like this? And the other question is also sort of philosophical. Do numbers really exist in reality? Or are they just a product of a, our human thought? So are they real? Are, it's just like you see a tree in the same vein, a number exists, but you can't see it. Or if we didn't have, if humans didn't exist, then numbers didn't exist either. And in the same sense, that refers not only to the positive integers, but to any category of numbers, negative or fractions or real or complex, or to prime numbers for that matter. And here is my final, uh, this is a link for getting the lectures or send me an email and I send you this link. So I thank you for your attention and thank you. hope to see you next week. I was muted. Uh, question. Uh, so do prime numbers get used in, in cryptography and do they get- Yes, actually I-, I yeah. Yes, very, very important in cryptography. Actually, I, the algorithms we use in everyday life when we use uh, email and WhatsApp and pay by credit card, they rely on fancy algorithms which are based on prime numbers. The encryption is, modern encryption is based on prime. I thought I, I had a bullet someplace. I think I forgot to read it. Yeah. And are they in some ways used in these calculations for cryptocurrency? That I don't know. So I never understood uh, what this cryptocurrency is. I'm sure they, are, they must be used to make the communications secure. But I don't know if they are used in the currency itself, in yeah. producing the currency or in... But uh, the, I'm sure there is lots of communication related to this mm -hmm. currency. So there definitely uh, the encryption plays a very important role. The name cryptocurrency would imply that it has to do something with cryptography, but I simply don't understand that. Mm -hmm. Peter, Peter, I have, a, I have a, just a comment. Uh, I'm about to read this book called the Our Mathematical Universe in which the author claims that everything is mathematical in the universe. So uh -huh. uh, I'm kind of, uh, what do you think about, is that the statement that says that the, the universe is just a mathematical construct? Uh, what do you think about stuff like that? When, when they say the whole thing is mathematics. Mm -hmm. That I, I, I tend not to, I tend not to believe that. What okay. I do believe is that everything, to express everything rigorously, we need mathematics. Nothing mm -hmm. can be, of course, we have chemistry and we have biology yeah, and so we have, but, but if we want to describe processes and reactions, then we need mathematics. So in that mm -hmm. sense, I believe that mathematics is, is fundamental and permeating everything we do. But I don't say that the whole universe is mathematics. Yeah. No, I, I understand. All right, thanks. And then the book is called Our Mathematical Universe. Uh -huh. I will look in case anybody is curious. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to, to add one little bit to what you were saying about cryptocurrency. Creating a Bitcoin requires proof of work. And the work has to do with something like factorization or something like that. So that's what these farms of computers are doing, trying to create Bitcoins by solving these difficult factorization problems. So it's not uh -huh. just communication, it's actually part of the uh, paradigm for creating Bitcoins. Uh -huh. 
that's very interesting. I'm sorry, I don't know the details of what actually is required. Yeah. yeah, I knew that they use enormous computing power, but I didn't know for what. But that's, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I just want to add uh, a little something. Uh, you sort of stole my thunder about the uh, uh, doublings on the chest uh, of the grain on the chest, <laughs> which uh, I was going to use in my upcoming talks in cosmology. I guess this is an ad for that too. But uh, <laughs> I think I still will because there uh, is a very uh, strong theory that uh, in the very early universe, there the universe went through a period of a hundred doublings as, as compared Whoa. to the 64 on a chessboard or 63, I guess, on a chessboard. Yeah. You, you better use that anyway. You, you'll have, there will be many, many people who didn't yes. hear the legend from yeah, me. So. I, I, I will leave it in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, then. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. For,